Hello, good morning or good evening, uh, depending where you are on the globe. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, here on uh, todiabetes.org uh, to give you an update on the research we are performing at the Diabetes Research Institute and uh, within our collaborators uh, uh, worldwide that comprise the Diabetes Research Institute Federation. Uh, uh, today I wanted to give you a brief update of where we are on the path to a cure for uh, diabetes. As you know, the Diabetes Research Institute at the University of Miami is uh, an international organization that uh, links scientists uh, worldwide to try to synergize effort towards a cure uh, of type 1 diabetes. The uh, effort is uh, supported uh, by several organizations. The main uh, supporter of our uh, uh, research is the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation, but many other uh, uh, organizations like the National Institute of Health, the JDF, and Hemsley and other are also supporting our research. And we have around 150 scientists uh, fully committed here in Miami and as many collaborators worldwide trying to help us uh, get into a cure in the fastest and most efficient way possible. That is uh, our very simple uh, mission for cure. We intend uh, a biologic replacement of the insulin producing cells that are missing, have been destroyed by the process of uh, type 1 diabetes. And uh, <clears throat> these uh, strategies that we want to implement have to uh, do their job and replace the function of the insulin producing cells in a biologic way, but without introducing other uh, problems like those associated with lifelong uh, immunosuppression. So where are we today? Uh, we know that uh, islet transplantation has been improving and progressing to the point that now we have completed enrollment in the phase three trial, uh, FDA phase three trial, to bring islet transplantation towards approval of, a, of the procedure as a mean of treating the most severe cases of type 1 diabetes. This has been thanks to a major effort of the National Institute of Health as part of the Clinical Islet Transplantation Consortium, which I have the privilege to chair uh, the steering committee of this consortium that includes centers in North America and Europe. So now, uh, over the last decade, since the Edmonton Protocol improvement in islet uh, transplantation outcome, we have been going much further with uh, anti-inflammatory strategies and improved uh, anti-rejection strategies that now allow islet transplantation to achieve results that are comparable to that that could be obtained with uh, pancreas transplantation with a whole organ transplant. Still, this is a, is a major success, but is, a, is not a job done to, to get to a cure. We need to be able to do uh, islet transplantation or transplantation of insulin-producing cells or promoting regeneration of insulin-producing cells or native precursors, but to do so in the absence of uh, anti-rejection drugs for life, because this would continue to limit islet transplantation to the most severe cases of type 1 diabetes. So nowadays, this is an experimental procedure that is still limited to those patients that have the most severe cases of type 1 diabetes in which uh, you either suffer by severe hypoglycemic episodes or hypoglycemic unawareness, that is the inability to sense where glucose level drops to dangerous levels. And so in this, in this few cases, like less than 10% uh, of patients with type 1 diabetes could find the justification to assume the added risk of anti-rejection drugs that, as you know, can increase the risk of uh, side effects like infections and even the risk of cancer. So, uh, so far, it's critical now to produce the next quantum leap in islet transplantation and in a biologic cure for diabetes that we move towards strategy that will allow us to transplant or regenerate or reprogram cells to produce insulin, but without introducing any other uh, problem or side effect. In this direction, <coughs> the Diabetes Research Institute is uh, 
heavily involved in uh, a research that includes a synergistic approach of different platform technologies that you can see as a puzzle of different technology and, uh, and a strategic development that combine uh, all or a few of them will allow us, uh, we believe, to deliver a, a cure and a successful cellular strategy for biologic replacement to restore biologic function of insulin production in the human body of subject affected by diabetes. So uh, we know now that islet transplantation can be trans transplanted, can restore insulin production, normalize blood glucose sugars, they can function long term. There are patients now off insulin for over 15 years. They can, uh, we learn over the years that it's critically important to control inflammation early in the post-transplant period. But we also learn that uh, the cells are very vulnerable to low oxygen level at the early phase post-implantation. And that also we need to move towards the definition of a strategy that will avoid the use of lifelong uh, uh, anti-rejection drugs. So for this purpose, uh, the Diabetes Research Institute and our collaborators worldwide comprising the Federation are now uh, approaching this systematic sequential integrated approach in which we have teams of uh, bioengineering, tissue engineering, nanotechnology scientists that are working to assemble a bioartificial mini pancreas, if you wish, to avoid the need of transplanting islets in the liver, that is the place where we put islets today. We generally, when you speak about islet transplantation, is like engineering the liver to become a double organ because you extract the cells from the pancreas, you purify the insulin producing cells, and then you infuse them in the liver where they get trapped by the capillary at the level of the liver. And so, in a way, the liver becomes like a double organ. It does the job of the liver and that of the pancreas. But of course, this in introduces some problems of retrievability. If something uh, goes wrong, you cannot extract the liver to extract the islets. And so, that's why it's so important for us now to engineer a site that is sort of a pancreas in with a physiologic root of delivery of the hormones secreted, such as insulin but that will allow also to manipulate this environment where we put the cells to provide other key components that we believe are necessary for long-term survival in the absence of chronic uh, anti-rejection therapy. So for this reason, the, while the bioengineer tissue engineering teams are uh, addressing the issue of scaffolding, biologic materials, and nanotechnology to provide a house to the transplanted cells, we are also trying to add components to this approach that will address oxygen delivery in the very delicate period, in the early post-transplant period in which the cells are vulnerable to low oxygen levels by providing locally the generation of oxygen until new capillaries, new blood vessel will feed the transplanted cells. Uh, in this direction, then we will add, we are working on adding other cell types that provide tolerance and provide protection from the attack of the immune system, such as mesenchymal stem cells, regulatory T cells, or uh, myelo-derived suppressor cells are under investigator, or endothelial cells that could support the survival of insulin-producing cells. And uh, we are also working on technology to protect the immune system from the attack of the immune system locally, like providing local delivery of immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory drugs, as well as uh, 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 developing a series of strategies for creating a biologic coating, creating a shield around the transplanted cells that will uh, uh, provide protection from the attack of the immune system. And this is a uh, by providing a very thin conformal coating to the transplanted cells or nanolayer uh, barrier technology to sort of create a stealth transplant that cannot be detected by the immune system. This is in a nutshell like the, uh, the strategy that we're trying to assemble together. There is a lot of research also in the direction to provide an adequate cell supply because we cannot transplant all of the uh, patients that we need to transplant just based on uh, adult uh, donors and uh, disease donor, multi-organ donors, like from car accidents or any other 
cause of death uh, that make available these few donors. If you think in United States alone, there are 1,500 pancreas available a year, but we have millions of patients to transplant. So uh, we cannot think to make a lottery system, and we have to work uh, uh, already now to develop unlimited sources and uh, alternative of insulin producing cells from stem cells, from animal cells such as pig islets that could uh, uh, provide insulin that is virtually identical to human insulin. And uh, other strategies include also reprogramming cells from the patient on body to become insulin producing cells, uh, as well as promoting regeneration of insulin producing cells from precursors that uh, we all have in our native pancreas. So if you can restore self-tolerance and eliminate autoimmunity, uh, you can apply then strategy to regenerate or reprogram cells in your body that will no longer be attacked by the immune system. And maybe one day we will be able to reverse diabetes without even needing an islet cell transplant. In this direction, uh, we are fully aware that uh, this job cannot be done by a single investigator, a single team, or even a single institute like our, where we have uh, many teams of uh, multidisciplinary team of investigators from immunology to cell therapy to bioengineering, nanotechnologies, and cell biology. But we need to open uh, the way to collaboration worldwide. Uh, the Diabetes Research Institute works with a complete open frame structure and full collaborative international uh, philosophy. Every scientist working here has to sign off to this philosophy and the Diabetes Research Institute Federation, which I mentioned before, is key because we are now in an era that evolved from uh, the old days in which scientists were like uh, the crazy scientists working in an isolation in his lab and eventually stumbling upon a, a research discovery. Uh, then we, we move to the second era that it, I define like the Manhattan Project era, where you put all scientists in one physical space to try to resolve a problem collectively in that space. But now we're in the third uh, very exciting era of research and science where we can eliminate geographical barriers to scientific collaboration. And this is thanks to internet and digital technology that allow us through the telescience platform technology that we have been developing to link uh, worldwide collaborations and uh, patients uh, uh, in all over the world, like if they're physically working in the same space, even if they're separated by an ocean or by different continents. So this uh, clearly is a tremendous uh, advantage that we have to take uh, uh, advantage of and th that will allow us to create project teams as needed, uh, merging competences and becoming uh, becoming uh, more synergistic, more collaborative, avoiding duplication. And, uh, and this is a big step forward, I believe, in, in our strategy and philosophy. The other uh, aspect that uh, you should consider, and you have the links in the web page of To Diabetes, is the fact that we formed the, the Cure Alliance. Um, you can check it under www.thecurealliance.org. That is uh, just the extension of the spirit and the strategy of the Diabetes Research Institute Federation for Diabetes, but creating the awareness that today we have such impediments and blocks on the road, on the path to cures that are not just for diabetes, they are the same for cancer research, for neurodegenerative disease condition. And today is becoming so difficult uh, to uh, actually execute new strategies or intervention trials that uh, because of a series of impediments that are like regulatory impediments, a massive requir requirement for uh, preclinical testing in animal models that are often irrelevant for the clinical translation. There are barriers uh, at the institutional academic level, there are economical barriers, uh, legal barriers with uh, patent laws and uh, blocking patents that deter scientists to carry forward something that could be a potential uh, cure strategy. That uh, I don't want to uh, lose a lot of time on these issues that are global and go beyond 
uh, diabetes research, but you can check them on either on Facebook, on the Cure Alliance, or on the website that I just provided, and you have the link. For diabetes, uh, instead, we are fully committed and, uh, and uh, all our effort is in finding a cure of diabetes and you can find more information on www.diabetesresearch.org. Uh, and, uh, and this is in, not, in a nutshell like the, the full panorama of uh, what are our, our activity are and also what are the challenges that we are facing uh, on the path of a cure and, and why I believe is uh, very important that besides focusing our energy to be collaborative, synergistic, increasing the funding for research, we also focus on eliminating or overcoming some of the barriers and the impediments on the path to cures because you could uh, triple the budget for research but on, if on the other side you hit a hole, a wall, to clinical translation is like putting a full gas throttle and then pulling the emergency brake and then you, you don't go anywhere. And this is one of the challenges and the risks that we have today, that there are so many innovative ideas and potential and clinical trials and so much. So often we are limited in our ability to test new strategies and to bring them to clinical trials because of this incredibly expensive and complex and regulatory environment where we all uh, live today. So uh, we can uh, maybe I see that there are a bunch of uh, uh, questions that start coming in and uh, I'd like to start uh, uh, answering uh, some of them to make it a little more uh, interactive and uh, So the information regarding the cure of diabetes, I just uh, discussed it for the Diabetes Awareness Advocate. Uh, you can find more detail, uh, uh, movies, interviews, and uh, notes on the site uh, www.diabetesresearch.org. Uh, so uh, in answer to the uh, to the person who has severe diabetes in his uh, 53rd year of life with the disease, uh, how may I be considered as a candidate of your progressiveness transplant is uh, uh, you will have to check when the new trial will become available. Right now uh, there is uh, the enrollment on the phase three trial have been uh, has closed, the, the trial has been completed, but we're waiting for to apply now for a biologic license application to FDA so that, that hopefully will bring uh, this procedure as an approved and reimbursable procedure for all cases with uh, severe diabetes. Uh, there will be new pilot trial coming, uh, coming on board. Uh, there are more perform at centers of the uh, DRI Federation in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere, but uh, we will post uh, information on this uh, on the website of the Diabetes Research Institute uh, and Foundation, and you can uh, certainly be in touch or leave your uh, email or contact information if you want to be contacted should new opportunity uh, become uh, available. There are also several other centers in North America and Canada, uh, like the Edmonton Group, that are still performing uh, several uh, active uh, islet transplant trials. And uh, Dr. James Shapiro in Edmonton is a member of the DRI Federation, and they're doing excellent trials, uh, as well as many other centers. So you, you can just uh, keep an eye on new possibilities. Uh, there is another question is, uh, I've been through a pancreas transplant, am I eligible for this one? Yes, practically uh, an islet transplant uh, can be performed in a previous failed uh, pancreas transplant. Uh, the procedure is not very invasive, it's done by <coughs> uh, local anesthesia. The, it's, it's a very simple procedure, the transplant itself, meaning it is a uh, uh, like a blood transfusion where you infuse the purified cells from a bag hanging like by gravity, like, like if you would do a, a blood transfusion. 
And uh, <coughs> then uh, one another question is, uh, are you aware of Dr. Denise Faustman progress at the Mass General Hospital? Yes, I'm aware. Uh, has been, uh, I know Denise since we were, uh, we follow each other footsteps. Uh, actually, I follow her footsteps in the laboratory of Paul Lacey at Washington University, and we've been in touch uh, over the years. She's uh, uh, have a very provocative new strategy to try to block diabetes, and I wish her all the best uh, towards uh, implementation and proof of the possible success of the strategy that she's been proposing. I know that is uh, highly controversial, and she has a lot of uh, enemies and people that are not uh, believing in the strategy that she proposes, but uh, I'm glad that she at least is, uh, is trying to move forward on the path of a cure, and I would uh, uh, support anyone that uh, remain focused on trying to cure the disease. So, uh, while I cannot comment on the detail of the trial, I'm glad that she's moving uh, on the path of a cure. Uh, how many cadavers are required for this transplant is the next question. Is uh, Actually, we go for one uh, to one, even though in the past uh, have been uh, uh, required to perform more than one uh, transplant, so to take pancreas from one or two or uh, even three uh, organ donors, uh, and this clearly limits even more the number of transplants that one can perform. Uh, our strategy right now is to go one-to-one, -one, and we are now doing some very important um, collaborative studies with uh, DRI Federation centers and uh, Cure Alliance centers worldwide to try to enhance the number of insulin-producing cells that you, you can obtain for any cell product. Uh, we are just meeting with a team uh, from Washington University on August 27 to discuss a new strategy that has been shown to increase 20-fold uh, the number uh, of insulin-producing cells from the human pancreas. And we are also working with another DRI Federation Center in Malaga to uh, study and bring forward a technology that, uh, that triggers beta cell proliferation uh, to enhance the islets that are available. As a matter of fact, we are now collaborating with uh, Susan Ilstad and uh, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and Regenerex. It is a company that has promoted this use of facilitating cell to promote uh, donor-specific tolerance uh, because it's a very uh, intriguing strategy that could lead to transplantation without anti-rejection drugs. Uh, she, she already has several patients who receive a kidney transplant that no longer need the immunosuppression. And we are planning, as we are speaking, trials in type 1 diabetes and in islet uh, transplantation or kidney pancreas transplantation to show if the same degree of protection can occur in the presence of an underlying autoimmune disease. If this will be the case, it will be a breakthrough because uh, this will allow us potentially to take a living related subject like a parent or a sibling of a patient, take the cells from the uh, blood, from a leukotheresis, from the blood of this non-diabetic subject and reconstitute the immune system of the diabetic patients uh, with the immune system of someone that is non-diabetic. In this way, uh, uh, it will be completely eliminated out immunity, but more importantly, there will be also a specific tolerance developed from any cell or tissue transplanted from the donor of the bone marrow hematopoietic cells. So uh, the eventual strategy that we're planning to develop in this direction is that you could take a living related donor, infuse immune cells, reconstitute the immune system of the patient with diabetes, and then once you documented the restoration of cell tolerance and donor-specific tolerance, go back and take a biopsy, a small fragment of the pancreas, expand those cells, and transplant them in the patient uh, treating the disease. This is a very exciting but very new approach, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to report on the initiation of clinical trials in the next uh, year or so. So another uh, <coughs> uh, question is uh, how much time is involved from when a diabetic person 
walks in the door until he she is able to return to a typical life home. Uh, I assume this question is related to to the islet transplant. Uh, typically, in, in an islet transplant procedure, the patient leaves the hospital the day after the uh, procedure, and we just keep it for, uh, I think, in the future. This will be outpatient procedure, and the patient will be able to walk home uh, the same day of the transplant. Right now, because these are experimental procedures, and uh, uh, under FDA, phase three trial, and IH uh, oversight, and uh, there are very strict metabolic controls, so we keep the patient a few days uh, in an hotel near the hospital so that they can come back for check and uh, ultrasound blood drawing to make sure everything is okay and take the appropriate uh, the controls that are required by the study design. But I think in the future, cellular therapies for diabetes will be outpatient procedure and the patient could go back to work in a day or two. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so where may I locate your progressive notes on this procedure? Well, if you go uh, on the website www.diabetesresearch.org, you can see movies, uh, animation describing the procedure, and. Uh, protocols, what is happening uh, with the procedure and what can be expected, as, as well as a timeline of progress uh, over the years. Uh, next question is, uh, what is the best course if you are a newly diagnosed, a newly diagnosed patient with type 1 diabetes to an unable better health without uh, insulin dependency ultimately? So if you are uh, newly diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes, you can check the website of TrialNet uh, in the United States, uh, <coughs> which is uh, www.trialnet.org, to see what are the current trials uh, uh, that are available, that offer enrollment, and uh, where people can apply. Uh, I know there are uh, there is even Another uh, trial is clinicaltrial.gov. Uh, clinicaltrial.gov, you can check uh, trials intervention for newly diagnosed patients with diabetes, and there you can find the listed also international trials of intervention. Like I just found uh, for, a, for the daughter of uh, friends of mine uh, here in Miami, I just did a check now and found that there is even one trial that offers intervention for children of the uh, age of six years and above, between age six and six, is actually the trial that is enrolling now in Europe and is a trial testing the effect of uh, vitamin D uh, in, uh, in, as, as an intervention to delay progression or, or, uh, or possibly improve insulin secretion in patients with new onset diabetes. <coughs> Uh, anyway, there are these are resources that you can find online. Uh, is the Edmonton protocol still active uh, in proceeding with research towards the cure of diabetes? Uh, as I mentioned before, the Edmonton protocol has been a very important first step, and uh, we've been collaborating uh, with Dr. James Shapiro to performed the first multicenter trial of the Edmonton protocol that confirmed that if you actually have a very strong immunosuppressive therapy and you infuse islets from one, two, three, even four donors until you reach insulin independence, you can get insulin dependence. The protocol with this protocol, uh, with Edmonton protocol, was that uh, Unfortunately, over the years, uh, uh, most of the patients transplanted were returning to insulin requirement. And since then, there has been an evolution, thanks, thanks to the collaboration of many um, individuals, mainly James Shapiro and Bernard Herring and our team and others, to see how can we improve these results to provide more long-term success in early transplantation. And I am happy to report that now the evolution of this protocol and the current protocols that uh, 
no longer include the combination of drugs that we found uh, afterwards uh, inducing a block of beta cell replication, for example. Uh, what we're using today is a combination of initial anti-inflammatory strategy with a T-cell depletion approach as uh, originally introduced by uh, Bernard Herring at the University of Minnesota and our team uh, testing also uh, CAMPATH initially that is a new induction agent that is now used uh, also very extensively by the Edmonton group and uh, so there have been a progressive improvement in the results also uh, thanks to this uh, collaboration between centers and uh, pulling out our strength and uh, knowledge together to try to develop the next uh, quantum leap in the field. Another question is, do you feel that overregulation is slowing down advances to your a cure, a solution that would work as well as a cure? Yes, I think that there are um, a lot of regulatory barriers, and uh, you can check this if you can uh, please check on www.thecurealliance.org or on Facebook, on the, the Facebook page of the Cure Alliance. And if you agree, you can click like because we are trying to build the support for this uh, awareness campaign. Uh, the Cure Alliance is not an organization that is competing with fundraising or is not detracting any attention on the search for a cure of any specific disease. We are just trying to synergize the public opinion, lay organization, uh, experts, scientists, and, uh, and leaders from the movie communication industry, as well as business leaders and uh, foundation leaders, to become aware that uh, the current regulatory environment, legal barriers, institutional barriers on the path of a cure need to be addressed and are of critical importance. Otherwise, we can either double the budget of NIH or pour more money in research, but if we hit a wall to translation and we, we get these impediments, uh, it will be impossible to develop cures in a, in a time-sensitive uh, uh, way. And uh, as a matter of fact, the slogan of the Cure Alliance is a little provocative, but says like in the next five years, you or someone you love may be affected by a now incurable disease. And the potential for a cure will depend entirely on what happens between now and then. We cannot uh, wait for someone we love or to be diagnosed with an uh, incurable disease to, to wake up. We have to become aware and do something to overcome these barriers because uh, the, the future of our children and the future of patients now affected by disease condition depends on our efficiency in translating research towards clinical application. So you have to, uh, you could uh, read an article that appeared on October 3rd, 2011 in the Wall Street Journal that was written by a former deputy commissioner of FDA that had a very provocative title, How the FDA Can Cost You Your Life. And that summarized in a nutshell like uh, how an over-regulated environment, if you put patient safety, which remain the overarching priority for all of us. But if you only have risk avoidance and you block trials until you're sure there is absolutely no risk, uh, and you don't have on the other side of the balance how many patients die every day or every 10 seconds, like is the case of diabetes worldwide, uh, then it, you risk to, to develop a system that is so perfect that paralysis is, uh, is the results and, and the best thing to avoid risk is just make sure that no trial is occurs that year. So that's why we, we are proposing now that uh, as the cost of uh, performing research is increasing so much, we reach now 52 billion uh, a couple of years ago were spent in research and development by big pharma and, uh, and, uh, and pharmaceutical company in general to, with an output of less than 20 new drugs or like over 2 billion per drugs that get to the market. And then if you look how much of that money is spent towards strategy that cure versus strategy that just treat, that put a band-aid on a wound that never healed. Then you can think of all the economic environment and the reason why so much is invested in treatment in the presence of chronic degenerative conditions that are not actually cured. And this is another aspect that should 
make us uh, collectively think because now healthcare in the United States is such a huge business. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, it's now over two and a half trillion dollars a year in the United States alone, or 18% of the GDP of the United States. And diabetes alone uh, costs uh, 210 billion a year. So, uh, of course, this is a, a huge market opportunity for some uh, company, and uh, and it shouldn't detract us or any uh, lay organization or foundation to remain focused on what is our job: that is, develop a cure and eradicate the disease, not develop improved treatments uh, that are, of course, important uh, and, and and provide big opportunities for profit when you're dealing with a disease now affecting 350 million people worldwide and uh, projected to grow to over 500 million in the next uh, two decades. But at the same time, well, the job uh, of industry is also to provide returns to their investor and improve the performance of the stock. Uh, in our case, if we want to remain true to the commitment to find the cure in the fastest and most efficient way possible, we need to synergize our resources, our small, scarce resources. We need to collaborate worldwide, uh, don't compete, but bring scientists together, create project teams, improve the DRI Federation efforts, and also fight through the Cure Alliance together with scientists uh, fighting for the cure of other disease condition to overcome and resolve some of the barriers that bring us all together because the same problems we have now to translate uh, clinical trials for cure of diabetes, uh, people working for cancer cure have and people working for MS uh, or any other uh, degenerative, neurodegenerative disease or autoimmune disease are facing. So in this way, uh, we are all in together for uh, with the Cure Alliance uh, objectives that if you are interested, you can double check uh, online or on Facebook. Uh, let's see another question is uh, <coughs> uh, is there a suitable age for this transplant surgery? Right now we cannot do it in children but uh, patients of uh, over 18 years of age can be candidate once it will be approved we think it will be the procedure that will be offered to all including children. Uh, what are uh, the out-of-pocket expenses? How much is covered with any medical insurance? Uh, right now, a few insurances are covering on a case-by-case -case basis, but all the transplants that we perform are uh, for free, meaning are supported by research funding or uh, donations through the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation or other funding agencies that support our work. And uh, or the National Institute of Health, as in the case of the Clinical Island Transplant Consortium, so that uh, so far the, nothing is charged to the patient for these um, island transplant procedures. Uh, there is a <coughs> question: What if you have neither a parent or a sibling living? So for that procedure that I was telling about donor-specific tolerance induction, if you don't have neither a parent or a sibling living, you can still take an organ donor and the bone marrow cells from that organ donor with the facilitating cell that uh, Susan Easter developed in the case of the strategy we've been planning to test in the, in the next year or so. And, uh, and then use the islets extracted from the pancreas of that donor. Uh, the advantage of the living-related transplant is that uh, it overcame the scarcity of organs, uh, of organ donors, so that uh, potentially could be a major uh, solution towards the shortage of organ donors. If a family or a relative or a living related uh, donor could provide both the immune system to cure diabetes and then the insulin producing cells to treat the patient could be, of course, uh, a solution. Uh, next question is uh, if there is there anything patient advocates can do to put pressure on the FDA to help relax some of the overregulation that slow this procedure down. Uh, yeah, one thing you can do is uh, to follow and like and promote awareness of the Cure Alliance on Facebook or on the 
web because this is just at the beginning is an organization that is a few uh, month old we are also planning to write a white paper that we want to distribute to all organization and presidents of countries and regulatory agency that addresses what are the goals of the cure alliance uh, the first goal is to reset uh, the regulatory framework and requirements from FDA or other regulatory agencies worldwide to allow for innovation and the development delivery of cures in a timely and cost-effective uh, manner. Uh, we also want to reset uh, overly, broad, overly broad patent laws that restrict scientific discovery and inhibit collaborative work and innovation towards the development of cure. And also, we want to establish non-profit center of excellence to promote bench-to-bedside research and knowledge sharing using the business model that was developed by the Diabetes Research Institute uh, Federation and the DRI in Miami, but uh, extending it to other disease uh, uh, causes. So that uh, while we remain fully focused to cure diabetes, our experience can be shared and can be used by other uh, disease uh, cure focus groups. There are several other objectives that you can check uh, online, but uh, mainly what they are proposing uh, with the creation of Cure Alliance Center of Excellence is to develop uh, selected centers in North America and elsewhere that can perform innovation trials towards a cure. So while the safety of our patients while developing cure must remain the overarching priority and focus of our strategic mission, we are also fully aware that right now these regulatory blocks are such that something must be done. So we propose the center that have the capability to provide safe cells uh, characterized with uh, current good manufacturing practices and uh, uh, with, that fulfill some of the criteria, they should be allowed to try, to try to perform a cure and innovative strategy, a potential breakthrough in six, ten patients, twelve patients. But then, of course, with an obligation to report and a very severe scrutiny of the results and determine at that stage whether the strategy that is proposed should move forward towards final approval or not. But if we impose too much regulation at the beginning, before an idea or concept is even tested, that is what prov promotes the block of innovation and the paralysis on the path of two cures. So I would like to see that as, for example, instead of doing one or two trials every few years, because you have to provide, it took us seven years to do the first patients with regulatory T cells. and. Uh, and uh, these are examples that you can find in any disease state, it's not just for diabetes. Uh, I would like to see 100, 200 innovative trial years because uh, it is only trying with a safe product in respect of patient safety and with all the ethic committee oversight and IRB institutional review board and especially with the informed consent of the patients that are fully aware of the potential risk is only by doing so that we will multiply our ability to test potential breakthrough and cure. It's not delaying every single test by five or ten years. <clears throat> Let's see, is it necessary for transplantee to be on a sustenance drugs for the rest of their lives? Uh, maintenance immunosuppressive drugs are now requested uh, for life in organ transplantation or islet transplantation, but as, a, as, as I was mentioning before, the new strategies that we are uh, testing for tolerance induction with uh, Dr. Ilstad, for example, for, for active tolerance induction, uh, require discontinuation or allow for discontinuation of immunosuppression uh, completely within the first year post-transplant. There are already several patients transplanted with kidneys that no longer require immunosuppression. And there are several of the strategies that I discussed at the beginning currently <coughs> under uh, uh, investigation at the DRI and with our collaboration uh, within the DRI Federation that are developing either barrier technology to avoid the need for maintenance immunosuppression or local immunomodulation to avoid the need of systemic generalized anti-rejection drugs. And uh, I'm confident that in the next uh, uh, three to five years, you will see major 
breakthrough and quantum leaps in this direction because there are already pilot trials indicating that you can indeed avoid uh, anti-rejection drugs uh, as they're currently uh, the, the general uh, practice in transplantation. The next question is uh, what has been the measure of success so far with the islet transplant uh, for example, length of time a donor has gone uh, without insulin. Yes, like the length of time a recipient has gone without insulin is a criteria, but actually in these cases the uh, primary endpoint of the trial uh, that FDA requires uh, is interesting because FDA didn't want insulin independence as a measure of success because they said, they told us that uh, in these patients affected by severe hypoglycemic episodes and hypoglycemia and awareness, that is the current indication for either transplantation, it is a failure of treatment. So it's the inability to maintain good metabolic control that we know is necessary and is important to uh, uh, prevent or, uh, the development of complication or slow down the, the development of complication. And uh, so it is the achievement of uh, normal or near normal hemoglobin A1C, like below 7, below 6.5, in the absence of uh, uh, a risk of severe hypoglycemia. That is the first objective. Of course, all of us are, uh, are working to get complete insulin independence. And we now know that you can achieve insulin independence for many years. Uh, there are uh, patients now, the earliest transplant, 10 or 15 years uh, of insulin independence have been documented. So there is nothing against islets working long term and forever in the absence of problems related to recurrence of autoimmunity or, or rejection. The real name of the game now is to make sure we can develop this strategy and tolerance induction, restoration of cell tolerance in the absence of lifelong immunosuppression. And, uh, and I'm confident that like is the case of autotransplantation where you take the islets from the pancreas of the same patients like for chronic pancreatitis or a trauma and you don't have any problem of autoimmunity of rejection. In these cases, you can see that uh, islets can work for many, many years without problem is the, the critical challenge in this situation is that often if you wait too long in a pancreatitis, the islets can be damaged, so the initial cell product that you have may not be sufficient for insulin independence. But, uh, but I'm confident that uh, long-term performance of the transplanted cells will not be the main problem once we uh, solve the problem of rejection and recurrence of autoimmunity. Let's see, is there a particular message you would like to get out to the masses about diabetes, cell transplantation, a cure? Uh, well, the message is, uh, is, is very straightforward. Like uh, we at the Diabetes Research Institute and within our collaborators of the DRI Federation and the Cure Alliance, we will not stop uh, and we will continue to focus and give all of our energy uh, on the path of a cure. And uh, this is not just by collaborating and synergizing our effort, but is also promoting awareness on what are the blocks that are now impeding translation of our strategies and idea to test them in real patients instead of doing years and years of uh, uh, animal research in models that are not often even relevant to the clinical setting. Uh, the next uh, question is, 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 in your opinion, do big pharmaceutical company try to slow down a cure through lobbying? Uh, no, I don't believe uh, in conspiration theory of the big pharma impeding actively the development of cure. They don't need to do so because uh, just increasing the bar of regulatory requirements to such a level where now you need uh, over a billion dollar and 10 years to develop a new treatment excludes or scientists, small companies or innovators to try to develop a company and a big pharma can just wait and cherry pick uh, what will eventually emerge if they are interested to support further development. But with the cost now imposed by the regulatory environment and the current situation, uh, 
that we are living in, it is uh, who has the resources and the time to wait uh, for 10 years or, uh, or spend a billion dollars to develop a new idea into a treatment. That's why we have at least to the regulators or, or relax and reset some of the regulation to allow the initial trial. Because if you can do 10 patients and show that there is a huge promise, then everybody will want to fund uh, that uh, strategy. But there is no need to spend so much money and spend years before you even can test your hypothesis in the first few patients. Because maybe 90% or 95% of this idea will reveal themselves not very successful. So there is no need to invest more. You can go back, reset, and uh, reevaluate and redirect your project teams into another direction. But what kills me is to see groups blocked uh, for years while they could be trying a solution in patients. Uh, uh, another question, uh, am I correct to summarize that uh, you with the stem cell transplantation, Dr. Shapiro with islet cell transplantation, Dr. Kausman with the BCG vaccine are all in collaboration? We don't collaborate directly with Denise Faustman, uh, even though I respect her uh, very much as a scientist. Uh, she has other uh, collaborators. We are in full collaboration with Dr. Shapiro, both in, uh, in the area of uh, transplantation of insulin producing cells, as well as in the definition of new sites for, for cell transplantation. And uh, Dr. Shapiro is one of the key members of the DRI Federation to the, together with investigators worldwide, like uh, Ekaterine Bershvili in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, with James Shapiro and ourselves. We just published a paper on a new site for transplantation of insulin producing cells within a vein segment that seems to be extremely promising towards clinical translation. We are working with centers in, uh, in Europe. Uh, in Italy, we have a uh, two DRI Federation centers in Milan at Ospedale Niguarda and San Raffaele Hospital. We have one in Palermo at Ismet. And uh, we are all starting a very important trial testing new molecules that could promote uh, a long-term survival of islet cell transplant and even stop autoimmunity and type 1 diabetes, uh, offering the advantage of performing these clinical trials uh, in a country where <coughs> One transplant costs a fraction of what it costs in the United States, and this is another complex uh, problem that will have to be addressed in another uh, setting. Uh, let's see. What work has been done in identifying the specific T cell response that is the root cause of autoimmune response? Well, there is a, a lot of work done on autoimmunity. We are now collaborating also with Bart Roep in uh, Leiden in the Netherlands to define all the subset of cell population that are uh, uh, the signature of autoimmunity and then can be followed also as uh, markers of how successful a strategy is to uh, block autoimmunity uh, through tolerance induction. So, uh, we know that there are effector cells uh, that are responsible for the initial immune attack, but we also know that this attack is very slow and often can last years. And you have a defense mechanism that can be promoted and augmented to try to tilt the balance against towards regulation and tolerance instead of uh, immune attack, effector cell, and destruction. It is a. Uh, it is a. Uh, really important that we can continue to, to develop this. Will diabetes be eradicated in five years? Uh, this, is the, this is the big question. I promise uh, myself that I will never uh, promise a cure within five years, even if I feel very strongly that this will be a possibility. Uh, we have to be very careful before uh, raising false hopes and hype, generating hype about new strategy, because uh, for so many years patients and their family have been exposed to promise of a cure behind the corner. I myself, I left Italy uh, where I grew up to develop the cure because it seems to be behind the corner within the next two years, otherwise we would lose the chance to cure diabetes in Italy, and this was uh, 1985. And, uh, but I really uh, am so optimistic now because uh, 
I rarely see a convergence of strategy, effort and collaboration internationally to bring the piece, pieces of this puzzle uh, together. The, the sequential integrated approach that we are developing at the Diabetes Research Institute and with our collaborators and members of the Cure Alliance and Diabetes Research Federation worldwide is such that I'm truly confident that you will see a major, major uh, advancement in the next uh, three to five years. This, of course, is also highly linked on how the Cure Alliance will be successful overcoming some of the impediments and barriers to translation, because uh, if we need 10 years before starting any clinical trial, then for sure we will not have a cure in five years. So I hope we will all all join us in uh, Facebook to like the Cure Alliance webpage and support the, the webpage at www the Cure Alliance and especially will support the DRI Institute uh, Foundation at www.diabetesresearch.org and as well as all uh, Cure Focus research organizations that uh, that commit their efforts to eradicate and cure this disease. Uh, is there a particular message you would like to get out the masses in the USA? Yes, uh, is a wake-up message because uh, I think uh, uh, what people think in this country is that there is someone and uh, for sure all the best is being done to develop uh, cures and uh, Often the, the, the people of the United States are not aware that there are such impediments and barriers that the few scientists that are still committed to do cure-focused research are fighting with an increasing high level of barriers and impediments. And this is not just the difficult to find funding because most of the funding goes to treatment and prevention and uh, and development of strategies that have commercial potential, but if you if you think that there is more and more uh, time, money required to develop a cure-focused approach, and less and less people, because there are so many opportunities to do drug research, treatment research, pharmaceutical research, that the, you really have to support the, the effort that are focused on a cure, and, uh, and there is a no such thing like thinking that uh, someone out there is going to find my cure. We, we have to all to become aware and think how can we contribute even individually. And it's not just donation, but it's also increasing the awareness, promoting campaigns, uh, uh, public opinion, maybe you, you know people in the communication, movie, music business that can help us bring the message out because until we'll be just scientists complaining uh, uh, nothing will happen, but the ability to to raise awareness is uh, if the American people will want to change, that change uh, will occur. I just received a, a beautiful email from um, a friend yesterday that was reporting on a Warren Buffett, um, let's see if, if we have time and if I find it is uh, is actually a quite interesting uh, message that I received and uh, yeah, this is uh, this is something that uh, apparently or allegedly Warren Buffett said in a recent interview with CNBC <coughs> Uh, I could end the deficit in five minutes, he told CNBC. You just pass a law that says that any time there is a deficit of more than 3% of the GDP, all sitting members of Congress are ineligible for re-election. The 26th Amendment, <coughs> uh, granting the right to vote for 18-year-olds, uh, took only three months and eight days to be ratified. Why? Simple. The people demanded it. This was in 1971, before computers, emails, cell phones, etc. Of the 27 amendments of the Constitution, seven took one year or less to become the law of the land, all because of public pressure. So if you think that now you live in a situation in which healthcare expenditure are 18% of the GDP, where we spend 2.5 trillions uh, uh, 
a year in the United States alone for healthcare, and so little is done to cure and eradicate disease condition, while so much is still investment and invested to develop expensive treatments or band-aids on wounds that never heal. It is time for the United States public opinion to 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 shake the tree because uh, if the people is behind an idea, Congress will change uh, the law and the regulatory framework can be reset and, and people will be able to move forward on the path of a cure. So thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention with this program. Uh, and, uh, and I thank Patricia for, for your kind uh, words. And, uh, <coughs> And saying thank you, Dr. Yucardi, you and the dear I gave me and my family the most hope and positive thinking and moving forward with uh, type 1 diabetes and ultimate away, ultimately away from it. This is uh, definitely my uh, life and my entire effort. Uh, uh, none of us is on holiday this summer. We are fully uh, committed to develop a cure and we will get this job done. Thank you all for your attention and for your support, and uh, see you soon.